This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. Welcome to TWIM, This Week in Microbiology. This is episode 156, recorded on July 6, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you? I'm doing fine. Life is nice here in San Diego. <laughs> San Diego, 72 and sunny. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. It's actually 83, but it's okay. We forgive you. Wow. <laughs> it's summer. It's summer in San Diego, but I thought it was always 72. Is that unusual? It al- almost. Wow. Give or take 10, 11 degrees. <laughs> and Michael, you, you're in the 90s, right? We're in the high 90s today with lots of humidity. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, where it's 87 degrees. Wow. Here in New York, it's 70. It's like fall. Ooh, <laughs> I don't know why. It hasn't been hot at all here this year, but go figure. Uh, I want to tell you for the last time about the ASM Grant Writing Online course. This is a course in which you will receive an overview of the funding landscape, learn what makes grants successful, and receive personalized feedback on your grant. Seven-part series It's going to take place in the fall of 2017, and you need to register. The registration is July 15th. That's the deadline, and that's coming up. You can learn more at bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17. Now, uh, we're going to, we have two cool stories for you today. But before we start, I just want to tell you we have received about 15 entries in the book giveaway. And at the end of the show, I'm going to pick one out at random. So stay tuned. And we're going to give another book away. So stay tuned. What book? What book? I'm so excited. The one we're going to give away. Yeah. Your book. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) and I didn't know that. Yes. I got a, I got a copy of microbe and uh, we'll give it away at the end of the show. But the one yeah, we're going to give you, we have, I, you, yeah, Elio and you and uh, who else? Uh, Emma Regera and Reg- Fred Neidhart. Fred Neidhart, right. It's the second edition. Gorgeous book. I just got it a couple of weeks ago, and uh, someone, a lucky listener, will get it. So stay tuned. Don't go away. And you can't fast forward. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I guess you could. But um, just listen, because we have two really cool stories, and Michael is going to, Give us the first one. All right, everyone. Um, This is a paper I discovered after our last whim, and I had the delight of having a conversation with Abe Moses and Jess Millar from Portland State University. And as I was doing my background reading on their story, I wandered into a series of provocative articles that were published in the Journal of Antibiotics. And the Journal of Antibiotics is published on behalf of the Japanese Antibiotic Research Association. And the paper I stumbled into by Richard Baltz was an invited paper in honor of Professor Omura to help celebrate the honor of him being awarded a, comp- a piece of the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2015 for the discovery of avermectin, which is a 16-membered macrocyclic lactone derivative that has this potent anti-helmetic or roundworm and insecticidal properties. And he shared the Nobel along with William Campbell. And the Nobel Committee wrote at the time the derivatives that they had discovered and worked on of which had radically lowered the incidence of river blindness and lymphatic filariarius as well as showing efficacy against an ever-expanding number of other parasitic diseases. The other half of the Nobel in that year went to UU2 for her discoveries conserving a novel therapy against malaria, which is artemisin, which is uh, a derived from a natural Chinese medicine from sweet wormwood that was originally used for millennia to treat uh, fevers, and she was, of course, recognized for this as a novel therapy. So today's paper, we're going to go prospecting 
And the title of the paper is Molecular Beacons to Identify Gifted Microbes for Genome Mining. And it's by one author, Richard Baltz, who's from Cognogen Biotechnology Consulting out of Sarasota, Florida. And he's published extensively on this topic and in this particular field. And so you're probably all asking yourself, what in the world is a gifted microbe? Aren't they all gifted? You're probably saying, well, a gifted micro, according to Dr. Baltz, is a microbe that will likely have the ability to produce a secondary metabolite, either through the employment of a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase, which they abbreviate NRPS, or a polyketide synthetase one mechanism to synthesize these secondary metabolites. You're probably also wondering what secondary metabolites are. And again, these are organic compounds that are not directly involved in the normal growth, development, or reproduction of an organism. And in bacteria, they are generally produced uh, by the population as it's moving from logarithmic growth to a stationary phase. So these are products that the microbe is making just as just about the time when it's going to be shutting down. I've always been fascinated by secondary metabolites and I learned about the wonder that our secondary metabolites from the I took this standard course when I was um micro major once upon a time. And the course was entitled Biology of the Prokaryotes after Roger Stanier's classic course that he taught. Here I learned that many of the microbes from the actinomycetes group encoded many more secondary metabolites than other microbes, especially those with compact genomes we often associate with pathogens. And to give you a perspective, the mechanics of making these remarkable secondary metabolite products, you can imagine them as generally big, small molecules produced by large, modular, molecular factories. And the ones I learned about when I was a graduate student are these non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. And unlike ribosomes, which require our messenger RNA to make uh, a product, these NRPS systems don't need any messenger RNA. And so here, each non-ribosomal peptide synthetase can only synthesize only one type of peptide. And everyone listening to this is probably will recognize at least one of them that I'm about to list. The, the best one that I always remember is vancomycin. And there are others of these uh, non-ribosomal peptides like daptomycin, one that every one of you probably got put on your skin knee when you were a toddler, bacitracin, and things like cyclosporin that, of course, has made transplant medicine possible. And, of course, these, these um, non-ribosomal peptides also are anti-cancer drugs like bleomycin. The poly so, Michael, Michael, the, the yeah, term sure. secondary metabolites, that is, distinguishes them from the, the metabolic pathways that we need just to make an extra, to double, to replicate. These Absolutely. Are, I think of them as like accessories. They allow the bug to do kind of extra. Other things. They, yeah. they allow them to do other things. And I'll just jump to that perspective. The way I look at the actinomycetes is they are effectively soil-dwelling microbes. And if you think about it, if we go back to medieval times, this is like the castle and the village. And so the castle served as the protector of the village, and it had everything that the villagers ever wanted. And when times of crises came, the villagers moved inside the castle walls, and the castle defended them. And so I view these secondary metabolites, which are antibiotics and other toxic things as, you know, a genetic hedge against the unknown. And in dirt, you can't really move all that quickly. Unlike when you're in a fluid situation like water, you can get away from predators and you're no longer as susceptible. And so you have to hold on to your your genetic information. You can you just don't get the uh, opportunity like we learned on the last twim 
with the coxellia where you can throw genes away because you're living in this sweet stomach of a, of a eukaryotic cell and it's giving you everything you want. Now, these polyketide synthetases are a family of multi-domain enzymes or enzyme complexes, and these are really huge machines that produce the polyketides. Again, this is a large class of secondary metabolites, but rather than just from bacteria, they can come from fungi, plants, and even a few animal lineages, but we're going to focus our attention today on only the polyketide synthetase uh, number one. And so when you look at the biochemical pathways of how some of these antibiotics like erythromycin and the avermectin for which Professor O'Mara won the Nobel Amora. Prize and Amora, Amora. Amora <laughs> and Nystatin and rifamycin, if you look at it, it almost looks like fatty acid biosynthesis, except here Mother Nature was utilizing one of her own natural products, namely lysergic acid, for no sane chemist would ever attempt to do such chemistry that are involved in these, these polyketide synthetic processes. I mean, it's really a remarkable chemistry. And here it illustrates the wonder of the small reaction volumes that microbes have inside their cells and the proximity of being able to do these remarkable things. And the majority of these secondary metabolite pathways employ a mechanism, and in bacteria, this is especially the case, where these mega enzymes have these thioesterases, or they abbreviate them as TE, that release these linear or cyclized molecules from the terminal modules. And these TE domains are associated with acyl carrier proteins. One is a peptide carrier protein called thioesterate, so it's PCPTE, and the other is an acyl carrier protein. And you remember from your fatty acid biosynthetics that you were sleeping through in biochemistry is, you know, it's always got this thioester that they're using to add to the growing chain of the fatty acids, and that's effectively what these small molecules are doing. They're just adding the other thing to these very complicated structures that are a consequence of secondary metabolism. And so these thioesterases are effectively adding the last moiety to the secondary metabolite, or if you will, the drug you are making. And these two genetic entities or dye domains are relatively small when you consider the genes that are involved in making this um, molecule. And this will become important as we move forward. The other trait associated with gifted microbes is they also intend to encode multiple MBTH homologs. And MTBH is nothing more than where this gene came from. And it came from mycobacterium tuberculosis, a CDC derivative. And this homolog serves as a non-enzymatic chaperone for these non-ribosomal adenylation reactions that take place. And if you think about it, they're making these small but big molecules that still need to Exit the reaction volume of what the do you mean cell. Small but big. Sorry. <laughs> small but big. Well, what do you mean? these are small molecules in the sense that they're they're smaller than proteins, and they have to get out of the cell in or because many of these secondary metabolites are exported out into the surrounding areas, and that was one of the things we did as when I was a student is we isolated antibiotics from the agar plates and were able to test them with diffusion. And, you know, it's the classic things they did uh, during that stan your lab component of the biology of the prokaryote. And what the cell has to do is it has to get these things out. And that's what these chaperones are effectively doing is helping these things get out of the cell. Now, so what's in this the paper? Is, what's I'm in getting, the paper? <laughs> what's in the paper? I had to give you that as background, otherwise you're going to wow. jump all over me. So 
this is what Baltz is encourages us to do. Now, Baltz, obviously, uh, from his title of what he's doing in the consulting world, he encourages us to consider that using a bioinformatic tool to simply count the number or nature of types of genes resident in bacteria with large genomes would be an effective first screen to hunt for the expression of these modular molecular factories that we have, if and only if the quality of the genetic information in the database was good. But he points out that many of the many of the whole genomes in the databases are draft. They're not their final form. And the problem with the sequencing technology of today is it doesn't do long reads. And so if there's repeats, you're going to miss some of it. Or if there's many strings of Gs and the actinomyces are notoriously peculiar in their genetic structure, and they don't always have complete sets of genes. And he goes into the paper, since this is only a snippet, he goes into the paper and points out how the sequencing technology doesn't quite measure up in the case of the draft sequences. And he compares and contrasts draft sequences and final sequences of whole genomes. And we then learn that these molecular factories, uh, you're not going to be able to find them from by virtue of the fact of the sequencing artifacts if you're looking for the polyketide structures or the non-ribosomal structures. So what his hypothesis is, and this is the story, is he's arguing to use these PCP TE genes or these ACP TE genes, the acyl carrier protein thioesterase, because they're sufficiently small at only 300 and 300 to 400 amino acids. And he's making the argument that let's use these to go hunting for genomes that may have these wonderful cassettes that can make new antibiotics that we have yet to describe because a lot of people are pretty clever, isn't it? it, It's remarkable. I think it's pretty clever. It's it's remarkable. And in fact, a survey of 37 important natural products produced by actinomyces are biosynthesized by these mechanisms using the acyl carrier protein or the PCP, the, the peptide carrier protein with these thioesterases. And so that's principally the paper. And then he talks a little bit about this anti-SMASH bioinformatic. And, and SMASH stands for, or anti-SMASH stands for antibiotics and se- secondary metabolized analysis shell. And so this is nothing more than a bioinformatic tool that will allow you to hunt. So if you're an ecologist and you're sequencing a lot of dirt doing med- metagenomes and you're you're wondering if there's anything good in this pile of dirt, you, you can run it against this anti-smash algorithm, but it's only good if you have a you know a complete genome. But what his argument is and what he showed in the data in the paper is if you use these two thioesterases, you can remarkably fish out to a high degree of fidelity these remarkable microbes that actually produce these polyketide synthetases and these non-ribosomal peptide derivatives. So that's basically the story. Well, this tells me that uh, bioinformatics requires special smarts. <laughs> that is, it if does. You, if you just try to look at genomes and mine data from that head on, you're not going to be able to do it in many cases. What you need is to really think through it, and this is what this guy did. So I think it's really interesting that a head-on approach doesn't always work. Well, that's how I summed it up. We have issues with draft sequences. We've always known that. But what we didn't always know is there's a need to understand your system. And that's what he understood. That's what I mean. He understood his system, and good probes work. That's the take-home message, is if you design it so your probe is an integral component of the product you're hunting, it'll work. Whether or not the mine will hit pay dirt, while it looks good on paper, 
it might be the old oil drilling metaphor. You may drill a dry hole, but you know it, it's a better place to start to to begin to to look for it. Yep. And I think it was a a tremendous honor that he offered this to uh, Professor Omora to celebrate the honor of his being awarded the Nobel for Avermectin along with uh, Dr. Campbell. So that's Very the nice. snippet in a nutshell. I really like the term that they coined, the molecular beacon, because it, it shines a light on what the important information is around mm. that pathway. So I thought that was useful. Michael, what, so what happens next? This is out there. It's published. Anybody could now start using it to, to look for yeah. They will. Yeah. They will. <laughs> I'm sure that with the actinomyces, a lot of the whole genome sequencing was kept proprietary by the big drug companies. Mm. They, they mm. have been sequencing since the 80s. And so a lot of these weren't in the open literature. And now with inexpensive sequencing, a lot of these things and with all the soil ecologists out there, a lot of the stuff is being sequenced in mass to figure out, you know, the microbiome of wine, the microbiome of this, all of the papers that we have covered. And, you know, it really offers you an opportunity to look back and, and see what's going on and you know, it was a really interesting issue of that journal because there were just tremendous papers in there. And, you know, the danger of, of browsing a journal is, is a giant time suck because you read one paper and you're happy. And then, OK, I'll, they're like peanuts. You just keep eating them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't stop. <laughs> it, well, you, that, that's the problem. And so I pulled this one because it was a, a complete story, and as Michelle so eloquently said, it shines a light on what we need to be thinking about. I love the acknowledgments. Um, he says that the avermectin producer, Streptomyces avermidilis, has, stands as a model gifted microorganism that has provided so much for so many. And a of, gift that keeps on giving. Keeps giving. I have to say, <laughs> I I was the beneficiary of it's some of its gifts. My wife worked at Merck for many years, and for the first eight years or so, she worked on ivermectin. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. Actually identified the receptor that the compound binds to on cells. Cool. So cool. I got some uh, some of this provision from, from the— put, it, put a kid through college or two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still working on that, Michelle. <laughs> Actually, it's one down and two to go. Not bad, right? Yeah, and the one down has a job. One down has a job next month, and uh, I'm very excited about that. Yeah, thank you, Ivermectin. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you about a cool paper that is just being published today in PLOS Pathogens. In fact, it was published 46 minutes ago. <laughs> the embargo <laughs> officially uh, was lifted, and it's a research article called Generality of Toxins in Defensive Symbiosis. Ribosome inactivating proteins and defense against parasitic wasps in Drosophila. And this is from Matt Ballinger and Steve Perlman, who are uh, in the Department of Biology, University of Victoria in Canada, and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research in Toronto. And this has to do with symbioses, in this case, uh, among insects. And I have to say, over on TWIV, we love talking about these stories. And this is, it's really cool that we can get one that, that involves uh, bacteria. So to, to give you a little background, most insects contain symbionts, some kind of bacterium that are helping them in some way. And many of them are what are called defensive symbionts. They protect the host against pathogens and parasites of various sorts. So in this paper, the defensive symbiont is spiroplasma. This is a genus of bacteria that lacks cell walls. It's in the class Molecutes, which also includes mycoplasma. That might ring a bell to some of you. Spiroplasma can be found mainly in plants and insects. In fact, it infects about 7% of all the insects out there. They can be pathogens. So in many cases, they're commensals. They provide some benefit, but they can also be pathogens in certain insects. For example, uh, spiroplasma can cause disease of bees of crawfish, and of plants. Best studied uh, defensive spiroplasma infects the woodland fly Drosophila neotestacea, and it protects this fly against 
a parasitic nematode, which is called Howardula aeronymphium. It's a parasitic nematode, which would otherwise kill the fly. The flies are protected by being by having spiroplasma in them. And this protection is so powerful that in nature, infected flies are replacing all the uninfected ones. I thought that was such a cool observation. It must be so, right? All the uninfected ones are dying. So they, there's such a, a fitness advantage. It's yeah, huge, that's right? So cool. It's really cool. So this is a relatively recent uh, addition, I suppose. Uh, in this paper, they deal with a a parasitic wasp that kills these two Drosophila. There are two species, Drosophila neotestacea and Drosophila melanogaster. In the lab, if you put spiroplasma into them, it will protect them against killing by parasitic wasps. Now, this kind of protection has not been observed in nature, but we do know that wasp killing is an important source of mortality for these Drosophila in nature. So maybe uh, spiroplasma does play a role out there, but nobody has shown it yet. Now, you may be thinking, how does the spiroplasma protect uh, Drosophila? Well, it's really cool. They, the bacteria encode a ribosome inactivating protein or a RIP. A RIP is a enzyme called an N glycosidase that cleaves A residues from 28S eukaryotic ribosomal RNA, and therefore the ribosome is inactivated. And all of you have heard of RIPs before because there are some very, very famous examples like the toxin ricin. Ricin is a RIP, and so is Shiga toxin. These are enzymes that basically remove uh, A residues from ribosomal RNAs and inactivate the ribosome. Now, there are two kinds of RIPs. There are type 2 and type 1 RIPs. Type 2 RIPs have two different protein chains. One chain has the enzyme activity, and the other chain seems to be involved in attaching to the cell surface. And then there are type 1s, which are the subject of today's paper. They only have the A chain, which is the, um, uh, the one with the enzymatic activity. These RIPs are also found in flowering plants, and they can protect them against uh, predators uh, and viruses. Now, this group has previously showed that there's a type 1 RIP in Drosophila neo, which I'll call neo from now on, in honor of the matrix. Uh, this, <laughs> the gene encoding a type 1 RIP is transcriptionally upregulated uh, in flies that are infected with nematodes. And the nematodes have signs of a rip attack. I like that, that phrase, the rip attack, uh, including depurinated uh, ribosomes. And they were looking at the genome of uh, D. mal, Drosophila melanogaster, and they found that there are five rip genes in the genome there. So they said, let's look at the role of these and see what they do in, in terms of wasps. Now, um, the cool thing about this paper is they develop a quantitative real-time PCR assay to quantify the amount of depurinated parasitic wasp 28S RNA. And this is cool because that re involves removal of, a, of an A residue. So you have to make your primers specific for that, but it can be done. They show that you can measure specifically wasp depurinated ribosomal RNA. The way this works is the wasp in nature injects its eggs into fly eggs, which then go through their pupation, right? And normally... Dastardly. A dastardly move. A dastardly move, yes. And then the wasp will uh, start to mature inside the egg and eat the egg from the inside and eventually burst out as an adult wasp. And um, this, is, this happens often in the insect world. There are all sorts of parasitic wasps that inject their eggs into various hosts. Uh, we've talked about them on TWIV. They can put them in caterpillars. They can even put them in ladybugs. And what they often do is inject viruses with them that manipulate the host. For example, in, term, in, the, in the case of the caterpillar, the wasp uh, injects its egg along with, with viruses that immunosuppress the caterpillar so the caterpillar will not reject the wasp egg. We did one, and we did one on TWIV a few weeks ago where the wasp injects its eggs into ladybugs. And along with the eggs come a virus that paralyzes the ladybug. So the ladybug sits there on the leaf. Um, the wasp egg pupates. It comes outside, forms a cocoon, and the ladybug sits on top of it and protects it until it hatches. And because the ladybug is paralyzed, you know, it's sitting on top wow. of this cocoon. It's protecting it. Unbelievable. And this is caused by a virus. All right. But today, and there are probably viruses involved in today's story as well, but they don't talk about that. 
what they do is they look at their special assay and ask when uh, the fly eggs begin to pupate, what do we see in terms of wasp ribosomal RNA? So in fact, on the first day of pupation, they, and, and this is so cool, they're just extracting total RNA. So you have fly RNA and wasp RNA, but their PCR assay is specific for the wasp RNA. They can see an increase in depurination uh, in the wasp RNA by day one, and it keeps going up. On the second day, it goes up even more. This is accompanied by a reduction in the pool of ribosomes, and at the same time, the wasp egg dies because it doesn't have enough ribosomes to make the proteins that it needs. There's also hey, rest in peace. Rip. R-I-P. <laughs> Did they do that on purpose, Michelle? I don't no. know, but I, I, why not? It sounds perfect. It sounds perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ribosome inactivating protein it has to be done on purpose, Rip, because actually it also induces apoptosis. Now, what's interesting here is that there are lots of lots of questions that aren't answered. So in some cases, even though the wasps die, sometimes the flies don't survive. So something is going on. There may be some collateral damage. They're not sure. They, they address, they, they, they do some experiments in a minute to look at that, but it's not a clear cut uh, situation here. Could it be a cryptic virus? It could be. Yeah. They didn't look at it, but that's possible. Sure. Uh, they did a time course to see when the depurination of the wasp ribosomes began. So again, remember, the wasp is injecting an egg. Egg starts to develop inside the fly egg. And then the spiroplasma in the fly egg are making this rip, which is depurinating the wasp ribosomes so they can't translate proteins. The first evidence of rip attack is about 48 hours after exposure to the wasp. So the wasps go in. They can see in the lab, of course, when they add the wasp, that's time zero. And by 48 hours uh, later, they start to see uh, signs of rip attack in terms of depurination. So the wasp larvae hatch at that hour, 48 hours. They get exposed to the blood, the hemolymph of the fly. And apparently that's where the, that's where the spiroplasma are. They're producing the rip protein, and this begins to uh, attack the wasp larvae. A, a really interesting question is, how is this specific? How is RIP specific for wasp ribosomes? Because, you know, the, we have fly ribosomes. We have bacterial ribosomes in there. And, and uh, why does the, why is the wasp uh, suffer from this? So they do look at ribosomes in spiroplasma. Uh, I'm sorry, in the fly with or without spiroplasma. And there is depurination of fly ribosomes going on, but it's much less than in the wasps. And they think it's not RIP stimulated because whether or not there's a wasp present uh, doesn't affect this uh, fly depurination. But they're wondering if that is part of what uh, causes fly mortality, you know, even when the wasps mm. are killed. So I have to interrupt because yeah, when I yeah. read this part of the paper, I just couldn't imagine doing these experiments. They, they bled the Drosophila larvae and then separated the hemolymph from the hemocytes. So basically, I, I guess I thought about this when I was a technician. Um, I used um, white blood cells from humans. So mm -hmm. humans weigh more than 100 pounds, and mm -hmm. we get some blood from them and then isolate the cells. <laughs> They're talking about doing that same thing with not fruit flies, but the larvae of fruit that's flies. Right, that's right. <laughs> Collecting <laughs> blood and then separating into white blood cells and then all the juice that's left by centrifugation and then testing each of those fractions separately. Amazing. This is why it's called Amazing. microbiology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. In fact, wow. this is an open access paper. You can check it out. The methods are amazing because... Like yeah. like Michelle says, small volumes and also, uh, you know, you have to give them certain kinds of food and certain strains only will work. It's just, you know, getting to this point is, is an enormous Ooh, amount of work. Force. Now, what, and and a, reason, a reason to look at the paper, by the way, if we can go back to the last experiment yep. that you described, um, Vincent, um, I was able to communicate with Matt Bellinger, the um, postdoc who did this work, and he is especially proud of that figure two that describes the time course that mm. you um, just laid out for us, where they looked over time with and without the symbiont and measured the amount of the attack on mm. the uh, ribosomal RNA. And it's just a 
really beautiful time course where you can just see the biology kind of unfolding before your eyes. You know, what's so nice um, it, is that the data are so tight. The error yeah. bars, except for one particular datum, the error bars are nothing. And when you look right. at, you know, animals exposed to this and that, and you find, you find that the graphs are all over the map. You know, mm. the, the points are all over the map. And here they're very, very tight. It's really amazing. Yeah. Figure Matt two is really he remarkable. still enjoys going back and looking at this figure. He's just <laughs> so um, amazed by it because it was the day that he realized in the lab that they absolutely um, had a handle on the biology because the data just, you couldn't ask for data more beautiful. Right. really spectacular. The experiment that um, Michelle referred to where they separated cells from hemolymph they did that to find out where the rip mainly is because they want to know why the fly ribosomes are being depurinated. And what they found is they did rip assays and they find most of it is in the hemolymph. And that's where uh, there's the spiral plasma resides. So um, they figure uh, the host ribosomes are there and they're released into the hemolymph and there's lots of spiral plasma that are making the rip. Uh, and, that's why they think that uh, the host uh, ribosomes are being depurinated. Now, the ones floating around in the hemolymph are not going to be involved in protein synthesis. So uh, that's kind of that's probably not what is uh, accounting for fly mortality. They did a genome sequence of Drosophila neotestacea. They found four RIP genes. So these are these are um, interesting uh, studies here. Two of these RIP genes are similar to. Uh, genes in Drosophila melanogaster, two of them are distinct. Uh, the transcripts are constitutively expressed in both flies, uh, both fly species, their larvae. Um, so they're, it looks like at a low level, these genes are always on, and then they're induced when the, uh, when the wasp uh, eggs begin to hatch. So there are multiple rips, and maybe they have different targets. Maybe they go to different cell types. Maybe they respond to different wasps. That's all interesting questions that they have to uh, address. There's another wasp, and here this one is called Pachycrepoideus vindemiae. Uh, this wasp lays its egg in flies, but it's on the cuticle of the fly. It's not in contact with hemolymph. Consequently, spiroplasma can't eliminate this wasp. Because remember, spiroplasma is in the hemolymph, and the other wasp puts the egg in the hemolymph, and it gets attacked by the rips, but this one, Pachycrepoideus, is sitting on the cuticle. It does have some depurinated ribosomes, but much less than the other wasps, and there's no reduction in intact ribosomes. So they say, they call this resistance to spiroplasma, which is interesting because I guess the resistance in this case is simply putting your eggs where the rip can't reach it, right? So yeah. Why mm -hmm. not? That's one form of, of resistance. That was an amazing control, I thought. It's pretty cool. It's really very cool. Beautiful. Now, they say that probably these wasps are ingesting toxins, all right? even though they're sitting on the outside, they may be getting some. So they speculate there, there are probably some resistant mechanisms. And these are, in fact, known in other flies, in plants, in grasshoppers. One, one example is uh, digestion in, of the toxin in the gut by proteases. So there are other resistant mechanisms out there. So this is just an arms race, right? You have a wasp parasitizing a fly, bacteria come in, they, they help kill the wasp, then the wasp becomes resistant, and what's next? It just goes around and around and around. And how this all happens is really interesting. I love the teamwork between the bacterium and its host. Yeah. and they, what, they, Their interests are aligned. They both want a healthy <laughs> partnership. That's right. Or so it has evolved, right? Right. So a couple of other uh, interesting questions. How these rips enter wasp cells, right? Because the rip has to get inside the wasp cell in order to depurinate the ribosome and shut down protein synthesis. Maybe there's a receptor which hasn't been identified. And maybe that's how you could get resistance in different insects. You know, you could change the receptor slightly and maybe the rip doesn't get in. So lots of very interesting things to do. Uh, and also the, the question of specificity, right? How is it the toxin specific for wasps and doesn't harm the host? That's an interesting question, which uh, hasn't been addressed when 
something that we can expect to happen. So it's basically, funny because you know you would think that uh, purines are purines, yeah, and that the enzyme mm. that takes them off wouldn't wouldn't care what RNA it's dealing with, but it does. So it this does, is, yeah. you know, it, it, it's it's going to be very interesting in zymology, I think. So it, it must could be, be the context, huh? The three D. Context. Maybe, yeah. I was thinking maybe the maybe the three dimensional structure of the ribosome, or or simply a receptor on the cell surface, right? That lets the toxin oh, right. into the cell. It could be both, but um, so that's well. You don't yeah, like that one. Sure. You don't like the receptor. Well, you said uh, you said that. Be. I like the enzymology better, though. Yeah, Michael, what'd you say? <laughs> you said there was only the A component. Tri- typically, these are these are binary in their design. There's a a binding component, which is the receptor, and then there's the active site of, of yeah. the toxin. Mm-hmm. Yep. If it's following the canonical, you know, two domain type of toxin system, my my suspicion is that there may be an antidote made by either the host or by the bacterium that's protecting it. But the type ones still have to get in. So yeah. Even though yeah, they do to. say that at the C terminus, there's a domain that they don't know the function of, and they're wondering if that might be mm-hmm. um, targeting it to a particular cell or yep. uh, getting yep. it access. So there's a lot of cool biology yet to be learned. No doubt. So that's it. That, here we go. We have a wasp that parasitizes a fly. The fly has bacteria in it that protect uh, the fly from the wasp by killing it using a rip protein that trashes its ribosomes and of course the spiroplasma the bacteria get a place to live how does it happen is is really the question i mean that this is fascinating great find so so matt ballinger the um lead postdoc who um did this work is a big fan of twim and twiv and so the first thing he wanted me to share is that in victoria bc today it's 73 degrees and sunny So it's Matt like was San Diego. <laughs> Matt was an undergrad, studied biology at SUNY Binghamton, um, but he became uh, fascinated by microbes when he was a graduate student at SUNY Buffalo with Derek Taylor, who is a freshwater zooplankton biologist who also just loved to chase down cool biology and neat ideas. So when he arrived in the Taylor lab, they had just started working on lateral gene transfer from non retroviral RNA viruses into mammalian genomes. So they call Uh. these paleovirus genes. And um, that was the focus of his thesis initially, and then he progressed into studying, um, doing RNA virus discovery in insects. And they found that by combining these concepts, the paleovirology and virus discovery, they were able to place into ecological and environmental context a number of the new RNA viruses that are being discovered now by by genome sequencing. He then, um, that got him interested in, in microbial diversity in insects and motivated him to um, apply to Steve Perlman's lab for his postdoc and was thrilled to be accepted there. Um, he described Steve as a lover of all things insect and microbe and an amazing supervisor and mentor. So he's been studying with Steve for about two years, and as he reflects on that, he realizes that he's really happy that he had the courage to step outside of his science comfort zone and make friends with some different kinds of microbes. (laughs) So he is now um, poised to apply for faculty positions in 2018, and he's excited to take the next step toward his dream of starting a research group where he wants to focus on insect, symbiont, and virus interactions. Mm. That's um, that's Matt. And again, he was just thrilled um, to hear that we were going to cover up one of his papers. He said it's a, it's a career dream of his. Cool. Well, we look forward to uh, more symbiont insect virus papers, Matt. We'll uh, yeah. let you have your own lab. And bacteria. And bacteria. And ba- symbiont, yep. <laughs> that's the symbiont part, right? Right. All right. As I said uh, earlier, Last time we did TWIM, we uh, mentioned that we're giving away a copy of Food Microbiology. And so we received 15, 16 emails. Today was the deadline. And, you know, you had to write, I love microbes in the subject line, and and everyone did. Let me just tell you a couple of these. Uh, Anthony wrote, through the lens of TWIM, the most common things can be seen to be really remarkable, a wonderful, invisible world. Chris said, 
Uh, I look forward to new episodes of the entire Microbe TV family of podcasts. Here's a cool one from John. Hi, Twimmers. I'm an avid listener to all the Twix podcasts, and this is my first email to Twim. To be honest, I find Twim to be the most difficult Twix to listen to in terms of content. The breath of biology leaves me floundering sometimes as a non-biologist. Twiv has Virology 101 and Vincent's lectures to give me a simplified vector into the jargon and the usually more macroscopic nature of TWIP's case studies offer an accessible follicle to parasitic knowledge, not forgetting the excellent Parasitic Diseases 6th edition. I've been reading pop sci books about evolution for years from the likes of Dawkins, Nick Lane, Sean Carroll, Neil Shubin, Matt Ridley, Jerry Coyne, and the likes, so I had a bit of a leg up for Twivo. Based on Vincent's gushing about Jonathan Weiner, he's been moved to very near the top of my reading list. TWIM ranges across archaea, bacteria, eukaryotes, fungi, amoeba, slime molds, prions, biofilms, the microbiome, immune <laughs> response, deep biochemistry, funding mechanisms, peer review, lab techniques, and sometimes the discussion hinges on very specific, some might say arcane, technical points. Nevertheless, when I'm groping around trying to find my way, it is heartening to hear one of the crew chime in saying that they got a bit lost too because a paper was outside their area of expertise. It gives me the courage to stretch my weary brain just a little further to regain the thread out of the maze. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great podcast. I look forward to many more. Thanks and regards, John in Limerick. Huh? Scott writes, I would love the opportunity to win this giveaway. As someone who has a hobby in home brewing, food microbiology has always targeted my interests. Thanks for everything you do. Uh, Sean uh, Juan writes, Dear Twimmers, thanks for the wonderful podcast. I was really excited to hear about the contest and simply had to stop listening to send out this email. Juan is from Singapore. Then we have one from Tyler. Hello, everyone. I'm a master's student at the University of Florida studying microbiology and cell science with a concentration in medical microbiology and biochemistry. Really enjoy your podcast considering the program is online and there isn't much verbal communication. Your episodes help fill that gap. Plus, Hearing different applications of the material I'm learning has broadened my outlook of the field of microbiology. Uh, Julie says she loves the show. I work as a clinical microbiologist in Denver, Colorado, and listen to TWIM whenever I get the chance. Uh, this is a funny one from Johan. He writes, another satisfied listener. Good work. Seriously. And that's spelled oh. <laughs> C-E-R-E-U-S. Bacillus serious. That's right. Yeah. Noah That's says, right. Uh, your podcast is awesome. Keep up the good work. Tanner said, I figure I would give winning a book a shot, a shot while reaching out to give my appreciation. My name is Tanner, and I'm a technologist at a national reference lab specializing in esoteric testing based in Salt Lake City. I love listening to your podcast every week while sitting under the hood doing my science. Twim number 150 is the episode that really got me hooked. It was so nice to see the appreciation for lab technologists and to see just how much we impact patient care. Unfortunately, I think the idea of how important we are is sometimes lost. Thanks again. Can't wait for the next episode. Well, thanks to Robin Patel for bringing that Great. episode to life. I think we pulled in some clinical microbiologists with that episode. Yisol writes, I really, really love microbes. Actually, it'd be more accurate to say that I love learning about microbes so that I can protect patients. I am a nurse. I'm an oncology BMT nurse, and so microbes are fearful things for us. I tried my luck at winning a book before. I'm hoping for better luck this time. But regardless, thank you so much for your shows, and which have transformed my long daily commute. And here's the last one from Hope. I'm a rising high school senior from Maine. I absolutely love listening to TWIM and learning what I can from it. I listen to your podcast every night when I go to bed although it bores my 12-year-old sister to tears. <laughs> when I graduate high school, I would like to pursue a degree in molecular cellular biology, and TWIM has played a large role in encouraging that interest of mine. Thank you for all that you do. All right. Well, Hope should buy her sister some, um, uh, or buy, buy a set of uh, earbuds for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know, Michelle. Maybe she'll listen enough and start to pick it up and like it. <laughs> All right, we have 16 entries, and so what I have here is a random number generator. It's going to pick a number from 1 to 16. Are we ready? Drum roll. Generate number 3 is the winner, and number 3 
is John from Limerick. Hey. All right, John from Limerick will get a copy of Food Microbiology. But I do have another book to give away today, and that is a copy of Microbe, mm. the second edition, of course, written by four authors, Michelle and Alio, in addition to Hema Reguera and Frederick Neithart. And same idea, send an email to twim at microbe.tv. Uh, this time, the subject line needs to be, I love symbionts. <laughs> and I'll just say, this is a textbook for um, majors, microbiology majors. It covers the whole gamut of microbiology. Lovely book. I have, I have a PDF, so I don't need the hard copy, uh, but I'd love to keep it. All right, so send us an email, twim at microbe.tv. Subject line, I love symbionts. The deadline is July 20th. And again, we'll, we'll give them each a number and pick out the winner by a random number generator. And that's TWIM156. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, also at uh, asm.org slash TWIM. And you should just subscribe. There are lots of programs on your computer or cell phone or tablet that you can use to listen to podcasts. Just search for This Week in Microbiology. Subscribe so you get every episode automatically. And, of course, we love getting your questions, comments, book contest entries, TWIM at microbe.tv. And remember, the current deadline the next book entry is July 20th. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thanks, Elio. Oh, lots of fun. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. I think the paper on the spiroplasma is absolutely fantastic. I had no clue. Isn't that great? I, a fantastic. Yeah, paper. I get My these. Uh, I get these uh, press releases from PLOS pathogens, and uh, I get them ahead of time. Which is today that paper is being published. In fact, two p.m. Eastern, it was just published. I guess. I see. I get them yeah. ahead of time, and uh, it just so happens it's going to be published right as we start TWIM. Of course, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Great. <laughs> it's incredible. I no clue. We have I, uh, talked about some of these parasitic wasps on TWIV because they they often deliver viruses along with their eggs, which do things to the host in interesting ways. We'll talk a little bit about, but it's incredible, right? <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's every time we every time you look at symbiosis in insects, there's something new. It's stunning. The, 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 the amount of surprises that they hold, they still hold, is amazing. I think. I have to ask you, Elio. Do you remember a time when no one knew about symbioses? Well, uh, I never thought about them, let's say. I mean, until uh, Lynn Margolis came up with it, you know, it was just not a subject that uh. was in anybody's consciousness. I, you know, I never never thought about it. Uh. The, um, well, Bakke has been known for quite a while, but nobody, only by the people who are experts in the field. The the story of the uh, leaf cutting ants and their that was sort of uh, known that there was an actinomycete involved in that, but that that's about it. I mean, it was. Well, what about termites? Good. The thing that's driving me crazy. <laughs> When was that discovered? Yeah, well, the gut of termites was a. You're right. The gut of termites was a very popular subject. Yeah. That's been yeah. around for a long time. There was a Garden of Eden for microbes. So. But generally speaking, you know the. But you know the whole idea that evolution is something other than just uh, mutation and selection is so powerful and relatively new. I mean, I did not grow up knowing that horizontal gene transfer matter, even though I knew that the theory of toxins carried by a phage. But, you know, that was it. It was sort of an exception. It was an awful outlier. You know, never thought about anything. You know, just mutations and selection was yeah. was it. So I'm reading. And now, 
in, in the bacterial world, this is you know not not the, not the sole driving force. Sure, I'm reading I'm reading this book by um, Mark Lane. Is that his name? The guy who talked at ASM, uh, Michael. Did you see the the first uh, session? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it Mark Lane or something? Anyway, so he says these these phylogenetic trees are all wrong because it's a ribosomal RNA, and most of the other genes got there probably horizontally, so you don't even know who's related to who. <laughs> I think it's right. You know, I, I, I had it. that discussion with Norm Pace when I was uh-huh. working on Sec A, because I had a long discussion with him about sentinel molecules in cells, and we went round and round because protein export is absolute in in microbes. They they have to get this stuff out, and Sec A is ubiquitous in the bacteria and the archaea. And the molecule and the sec A is is uh, extremely similar at a structural level, but not at a um, DNA level. But the protein is of the same size. The it's an active ATPase, and it's a molecular chaperone. So it's a multifunctional protein, and it works. And so I said to Norm, I said, "Why don't we use that molecule? It has more information because it's 102 kilodaltons in length." And it's, you know, it's, message, it's messages much longer and it's, it's universal to at least two of the kingdoms. And I said, what say? he said, it's, it's, we've already established the ribosomal RNA and it's going to be very, this was before cheap sequencing, before cheap sequencing came out. And he said, you know, what will, what will it tell us beyond what we already know? And I didn't have a Jesus. good comeback. I didn't. But tell him that what we know is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, the well, thing you know, is, uh, it could have still been swapped, right? It could have. Well, you know, the interesting thing about Sec A, and this was a hypothesis I could never get funded when I was a young assistant professor, is in the facultative intracellular parasites, there's a second copy of the gene that can be deleted. In uh. the the primary version of Sec A can't be deleted, disrupted, nor destroyed in any bacteria or archaea because it's a lethal mutation. But the second copy of Sec A, which is different, is in Listeria, it's in tuberculosis, it's in all these facultative intracellular parasites. So the hypothesis I was positing is does this second protein secretion factor enable these organisms to live as facultative intracellular parasites. And it was well before the days of cheap sequencing, and I could never get any traction at the grant agencies to, to fund it, even though it was a simple, straightforward, you know, go and look at facultative intracellular parasites and ask what components of the secretion machine are present. And, you know, try to begin to decipher what makes intracellular parasitism possible. And it goes back to this paper in PLOS of how do these things adapt? uh, That's the thing, the sequence of events. 